I really do. I pray that you all have enjoyed this gospel of Mark. I tell you, the, the deeper we continue in it, and you realize you are literally walking side by side with Jesus and the disciples, and uh, it has been an incredible adventure. And so let me pray for this word, and we'll get started as folks continue to come back. But Lord, Father, we thank you. Lord, we are so grateful. We are so grateful for the Holy Spirit. We are so thankful for the movement of the Holy Spirit. We are so thankful for a body of believers who open themselves up as yielded, willing vessels to receive the goodness of the Holy Spirit. So, Lord, it is in that, that reception and that yieldedness and in the overflow of the Holy Spirit that I'm going to minister this word. And I pray for hearts willing to hear and, and ears excited to hear. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, as a kid, and, and I've shared it with a couple of people this week, and they admitted a little bit. And you remember as a kid when somebody told you what to do? And what was your reply? Well, who died and made you king? And it's usually to an older brother or sister. But what we were doing was, other than being sassy, is we were just, we were checking authority. We wanted to make sure that there was legitimacy in their, in their instruction giving. Now, what I will tell you today, what we're going to talk about is the Jewish leaders are going to ask Jesus by, about his authority. They're going to question his authority. Now, I would suspect that they knew who sent him and by which authority he was speaking. And that's the one thing that the Lord put on my heart for you today. The one thing the Lord put on my heart is that authority comes from God and you are commissioned with his authority to do his will. You have God's authority, God's commissioning, God's legal authority, but you have God's authority to do his will. I encourage you to move in God's will, to exercise the exousia, the legal authority of God. And this is important because the spiritual fruit that God requires you to produce, remember, you are required to produce spiritual fruit. That production of fruit only comes through the authority he has given you to operate within. Operating outside of God's will, you're manufacturing fruit, and that is not legitimate. God's given you the power. He's given you the opportunity. And he shines his face upon you to see you move in the goodness of his will. So if we can stand together and let's read the anchor scripture for today, and it comes from Mark 11, 27, 33, and it's Jesus' authority question. And let's read together as the body. Then they came again to Jerusalem. And as he was walking in the temple, the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders came to him. And they said to him, By what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority to do these things? But Jesus answered and said to them, I also will ask you one question. Then answer me. And I will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John, was it from heaven or from men? Answer me. And they reasoned amongst themselves, saying, If we say heaven, he will say, Why then did you not believe him? But if we say from man, they feared the people, for all counted John to have been one of the prophets indeed. So they answered and said to Jesus, We do not know. And Jesus answered and said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. Thank you, Lord, for that good word. Thank you for that word and that wonderful example and how we should counter the demonic world's attack on the authority of God. I tell you, God didn't send us here to, to win arguments. He sent us here to win souls. So I want to I make sure that the, they understand that the stage has been set. We are in the last week of Jesus' life on earth. The Jewish religious leaders... Not the Roman government are trying to control the escalating situation with Jesus. They see a, a storm a coming. They see what's on the horizon. Not the Roman government, but the Jewish elites. You see, because Jesus is beginning to threaten their man-assigned authority. And the, and the elites don't like that. They like their comfortable lives of leisure and pleasure and ease. 
You see, this is now Wednesday that this is going to occur. This direct confrontation with the Jewish religious elites would end on Friday with his crucifixion. Mark eleven twenty seven 27 says, Then they came again to Jerusalem. The timeline of the Passion Week is so important. Remember on Monday, Jesus rode in on the back of a colt, on the back of a baby donkey. To the cries and the adulations of Hosanna, King Jesus the Messiah. But remember we talked about on the next day when he cursed the fig, the fig tree. It had leaves, but it had no fruit. Remember the significance of that was produces the figs and then the leaves. So then if the leaves are there, it means the fig should be there. When Jesus found the fig tree, there was no fruit. He cursed it. It was an illustrative example of the nation of Israel. There was no spiritual fruit in their ministry. So that was on Tuesday. He moved in and he cleared the temple. And now here we are on Wednesday. So he and his disciples are returning to Jerusalem from their overnight stay in Bethany. And we've talked a bit about Bethany and Bethpage where Jesus was staying. And just for some relevance, it was about two miles away from Bethlehem. Uh, from Jerusalem. Uh, It was on the eastern slope of the Mount of Olives, and it was actually the home of Mary, Martha, and and Lazarus. This is, Jesus was familiar with this area of Bethany. It was an area where he was able to get safe refuge in the evenings from all the madness going on in Jerusalem. But here we are Wednesday in the Passion Week, Wednesday in the last week of Jesus's life on earth. And today is going to be about the confrontation is about authority. It's about authority. Who gave Jesus the authority to judge them? And remember, we talked about it last week. Everyone will stand before the Lord. Everyone will be judged. You see, that fig tree, that was just an illustrative example of God's judgment on the nation of Israel. That same day, the clearing of the temple was an act of judgment on Israel. You see, Jesus judges righteously because he came acting under God's authority to righteously judge. And and, and I just want to make sure we're going to talk a little bit about judgment because we will all face judgment. I think because of the natural inclination, the natural slant of the word judgment, we look at it as in a negative way. Oh, I don't want none of that. Oh, I don't want none of that. But I will tell you, Every one of us, everyone will face judgment. You know, I tell you that Jesus didn't come to play party host, to get everybody feeling fuzzy about getting along. This is not why he came. You either come into righteousness by transforming and renewing your mind with God's word, or you remain in the, in the darkness of sin and separation from God. Like God wants restoration. He wants redemption. He craves relationship. And what judgment does, it begins the process of correction and reconciliation. You see, when you're you're living your faith life based on your emotions, you mistake correction and conviction for, for getting your feelings hurt. So you go off where you don't get your feelings hurt. But what you do is you walk away from the opportunity to come into correction and reconciliation and relationship with the living God. That's why it's so important that we are spirit-led, that we're spirit-led. That's why the word of the Lord is so important, because it is spirit. You see, Jesus came to set a standard for righteousness. It requires division between those who are in right standing and those who are not in right standing. There's a lot of people, there's a lot of self-professed Christians who think, well, you know, I mean, I mean, it's God. He's a good God. Like, he's just going to let everybody in. I'm telling you all, he's not. He didn't send his son to the cross to just to drop the standard. Jesus tells us in Matthew 10, 34, Do not, this is Jesus, do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. Now I'll tell you, it's not a literal sword. He's not going to battle. In the Greek, the word that is used for sword is makara, 
We've talked about this before when we walk through the book of Ephesians. The word sword, makara. The description is, it is a large knife, a dagger. It is about two feet long. It is sharp on either end. It's got a small tip on the, at the end of it. And the Roman warriors were so skilled at battle. They didn't waste their time slashing and hacking and throwing. That, ex, that exerts energy. That's wasted energy. What they did was they jabbed and they jabbed and they jabbed. And I know it's, 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 it's real because I want you to see how real it is. It only took an insertion of two inches to be lethal. I want to tell you, that's how quick the Holy Spirit, the sword, should convict us. He shouldn't have to keep wailing and wailing and wailing. If you're being spirit-led by the word of the Lord, the word of the Lord, the sword, is quick and convicting. And this is what Jesus is talking about in Matthew 10, 34. You know what? Where else do we hear about the word sword? Well, I just told you from Ephesians 6, 17. It says, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. It is the same Greek word, makara. It transforms your mind from a life of sin into a life of righteousness. It's quick. It's convicting. This is what Jesus is talking about. He's talking about the words that you speak the words of the Lord that are transformational and convicting. So the Greek word for sword is makarai. It also means a dagger. It also means the power of life and death. Jesus comes with a sword, the word of God, the power of life and death. Where else do we see power of life and death? In Proverbs 18.21, death and life are in the power of the tongue. And those who love it will eat its fruit. I will share this as an equipping moment. You will be judged for every word you say. Be mindful of what you speak. You have the choice to speak death and the choice to speak life. And it's not just speaking death to other people. Most of the time we speak death to ourselves. I can't do this. I'm too young, I'm too old, I'm too rich, I'm too poor. I'm too this, I'm too that. Stop speaking death over yourself. Speak life, speak truth, speak the word of the Lord because you will be judged. Matthew 12, 36, 37 tells us, but I say to you that for every idle word men speak, they will give an account on it on the last day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. In this life, your words have the power to bring death or life. You have the power to choose what you say. Choose wisely. Choose wisely. Look, I know sometimes I'm talking to men and I'm encouraging them to stop cursing. And then, oh, it's just a little slip of the tongue. But that's when you're emotion driven. I just got so angry. I just got so mad. That word slipped out. We see that's the problem. You're being soul driven. You're being led by your emotions to react to something instead of pumping the brakes and and asking the word for a word. Be led in the spirit. So let's continue walking through this, through this uh, scripture. So Mark 11, 27, it's what I call the big shots come calling. And he was walking in the temple. The chief priests, the scribes, and the elders came to him. Thousands and thousands of people had gathered on the streets, calling his name and throwing the, the cloaks off their back. Here it is Wednesday. Nobody even knew who he was except the elites. You see, when it says in the Greek, I'm sorry, in the Hebrew, as he was walking, what that means is to maintain a certain walk of life, a conduct, the way you live your life. I will tell you, when I was in law enforcement, I would always tell people, if you've got to tell somebody you're in charge, you're not in charge. People can tell who's in charge. People can tell who's got authority. 
People can tell the way that you walk your life by that Hebrew he was walking. How do you walk your life? I don't talk, I'm not talking about the physical gait. Of course, that's important too. But if you got to tell people you're in charge, you're not in charge. People see your authority. The way that Jesus carried himself is signaled to everybody from the, from the Pharisees to the demons that Jesus was a man of authority. What I'll tell you, you have the same Holy Spirit authority in you. You have the same authority. Make sure that you walk in that authority. Make sure you talk in that authority. Make sure you post in social media in that authority. Make sure you minister to other people in that authority. Not out of your emotions. Out of the authority that God's given you. Through the what? Through the makara, Through the word. Through the sword. You see, these heavy hitters, they're approaching Jesus. No doubt they've been assigned by the other leaders to like, look, y'all go ahead and handle this situation. And when I look at Mark eleven twenty seven, 27, it says, came to him. They came to him. These are people that people come to. These are people in the world are waited on hand and foot. These are people who have their feet washed. And yet they do what? They came to him. I will tell you, everybody will come before Jesus. Everybody will come before Jesus. You see, they don't even realize what might seem like a simple act of just going to Jesus. They're actually, it's a prophetic affirmation of Scripture. We can look at 2 Corinthians 5.10. Uh, 5, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. We will all come before the judgment seat of Christ. These elites who operate in traditions of man and their love of the law more than their love of the Lord, they came to Jesus. We will all come before Jesus. So I want to spend some time on judgment for a couple of reasons. We will all face God's judgment. We always hear about judgment in a negative context. So I want to give some clarity to that. It's also hard to relate to judgment in the spiritual realm because there is a natural association of condemnation. And I don't want you to miss the seriousness of what Jesus is doing when he casts judgment on the nation of Israel. Sometimes like, oh, well, he was mad. I get it. I mean, I get mad at people too. This isn't it. I want you to understand. I want you to carry the weight of what he's doing when he casts judgment. And what I will tell you is that believers will be judged differently than non-believers. I will share this word this morning as I was praying. And I always pray, Lord, bring your people. Bring your people. And this morning the Holy Spirit was so that correction, course change, pray instead that the people that are not my people come so they will become my people. You see, the gospel message is for his people that don't realize that they need to be his people. We have got to be sharing the gospel to non-believers. We've got to share the gospel to non-believers. So I want to share with you the judgment seat of Christ. I want you to understand when he's talking about this, what this is. This is for believers. This is for believers. This is not about determining your salvation. Your salvation has been secured through faith in Jesus Christ. The judgment seat of Christ, it comes after the rapture when the church is raised up. The only people to be raised up, to be recalled, restored, lifted, are going to be the church with a capital C. This is the rapture. This is before the tribulation. Now, there's disagreement in that. You've got pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib. But this isn't the issue we're talking about. What I want you to understand is that the judgment seat of Christ is going to happen after the church, capital C, is raised up. This judgment is about rewarding you for faithful service. It's not about determining your state of salvation. Your salvation is secure through your faith in Christ. 
This is only for believers. Non-believers will remain where they are. Whether they're dead, whether they're at the bottom of the sea, or whether they're living their lives, they do not experience this judgment seat of Christ. But they will receive judgment. So I want to go a little further. I want to take you to the, the judgment seat of God. A lot of times the judgment seat of Christ and the judgment seat of God are used interchangeably. But there's a distinction. And this is called, also known in Revelation, as the great white throne judgment. So I want to read this to you. This comes from Revelation 20, 11, 15. And I want you to read it. But then I saw a white throne and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and heaven fled away. But there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God. And books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. And death and Hades were, were delivered up to the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. This is the final judgment. This is the final judgment for all people, for believers and non-believers. This is going to occur after the millennial reign, after the thousand-year reign of Christ, after the final rebellion and the final defeat of Satan. Everyone will be judged. And those who have not received Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, and if it doesn't break your heart and light a fire for the intensity that we, we've got to share the gospel with the lost, and anyone not found written in the book of life, was cast into the lake of fire. And so you'll get people that, well, well, how could a loving God do that? A loving God sent his only son. That's it. Come on. You see, Come on. throughout our whole lives, we were given the opportunity to choose Jesus as our Savior. We, we have a calling, a commission to share the gospel, to plant seeds. Paul tells us some plant, some water, God brings the increase. Are you planting seeds? Are you watering? I encourage you. I implore you to have that same burden to share the gospel with the lost, Amen. to not get comfortable with just us saints coming together every Sunday and sharing the gospel message, the same gospel message that brought us into righteousness, to not get comfortable with that, to bear the burden of responsibility for the lost to evangelize, to share the gospel, to share the truth. But I don't want to discourage you. I don't want to discourage you. But there is judgment for everybody. You know, this little nugget, I people, oh, I want to teach, I want to preach. I'm like, amen for that. James 3.1 tells us, My brethren, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. You see, this is not to discourage anyone from, from teaching and preaching and moving into ministry, but let it be an encouragement that there is a standard of righteousness that God demands. Before you start sharing Scripture, no Scripture. But share Scripture. You see, what I want to tell you is that there are demands for faithful service as a citizen of heaven. God's righteous judgment is our opportunity to come into repentance, confession, and correction. Do not let the reality of judgment discourage you. You will be judged in the judgment seat of Christ based on your good and faithful works. Let that be encouragement to do good and faithful works. Let the goodness, the fruit of the Spirit that manifests itself in you, let it manifest itself in good works. So let's get back in the Scripture. It's weird talking about judgment because we don't want to think about that sometimes. But let it encourage you, saints. Let it encourage you, saints. Let it encourage you. Amen. So Mark eleven twenty eight, 28. And they said to him, By what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority to do these things? Well, I will tell you, in the Greek, the word authority is exousia. 
It is power, ability, energy, dominion, jurisdiction. Like the kingdom of God, we've got to remember, we're talking about a system of governance. The kingdom of God is a system of governance and rules and regulations and structure. God is a God of order and God gives legal authority so if someone's out there and they've not received, if they've not received Jesus Christ and they're preaching and they're teaching, you're going to wind up like Sceva's seven sons who were trying to do deliverance in the name of Jesus, who Paul follows. They weren't even delivering in the name of Jesus. And what happened if you recall the story? That demon jumped on those seven boys and they paid a price for operating outside the exousia the legal authority of God. You, as a believer, have the exousia. You have the legal authority. You have the jurisdiction. You have God's permission to go and do. But you got to be covered. you got to be granted the legal authority to act on God's behalf. Otherwise, people are out there. I always talk about, be careful of these solo rogue actors. A lot of these social media influencers, they don't belong to a local church. They don't belong to a covering. They're just good at putting out social media. And all of a sudden, they got a million followers, and that makes them legitimate. It makes them dangerous. Be careful. Be careful. Check the exousia. Check the legal kingdom authority. Now, we're talking about it. They give you the authority for power. There, then there's, there's dunamis which is the internal power. That is the Holy Spirit inside of you. That is the power of God inside of you through the Holy Spirit. And then there's the kratos power. That is the outward manifestation of God's power. That is when a couple comes up and Pony is, is giving prophetic words. That is kratos power. When we're ministering deliverance, that is kratos power. When the 600 elite Roman soldiers come to Jesus in the garden, and he's like, what y'all doing? We're looking for Jesus. I'm him. 600 laid out. That is the outward manifestation of the tangible power of God. The reason people are able to manifest the outward demonstration of the power is because they've got the dunamis, the Holy Spirit, and they have the, what, exousia. They have the legal authority to operate in that every one of us in this church have the exousia. Will you exercise it? I've shared before, when I was the chief of police, I would commission my officers. I gave them legal authority to make an arrest. But not everybody made an arrest. Not everybody wanted to uphold their duty. They were still commissioned. You have the authority the exousia. Use it. So we're talking about governance. This is what the elites are asking Jesus. Who made you king? Who gave you authority? The kingdom of God. God the Father gave him the authority. So 1128 continues, and it says, who gave you the authority to do these things? They know that only God could give that type of authority to do the miraculous things that Jesus had did. And listen, they've been following him for about three years. They've done an extensive surveillance system on Jesus. They have saw him raise Lazarus a couple days earlier. They knew about the fig tree. They knew everything that he did. They were standing there when John the baptizer baptized him. So when they say these things, they're not just talking about a couple little things. They've got a whole list of miracles that they knew only through the exousia, through the power of God the Father, could Jesus Christ do that. They knew he had God's authority. They knew he was not a magician or a trickster. You see, but admitting that meant admitting that he was the son of God, that he was the Messiah. You see, there's different types of authority, and they had locked themselves under the, the safety of the Roman authority. You see, there's different types. There's worldly authority. And this is what the elites have locked themselves under. They received privilege and favor because of the Roman Empire. They did not receive their exousia from God the Father, the religious elites. You see, what they're asking Jesus is, well, well, what Bible college did you go to? Like, where's your credentials? I mean, I see your office wall. I don't even see 25 certificates hanging from a nail. Like, who are you to do this stuff? But they knew. That could only come 
from the power of God. But you see, they'd gotten confused because they were looking at Rome that reigns over the entire civil, or most of the civilized world. They are looking at a different system of government that was giving them authority and permission. You see, they were set up as babysitters. If you can keep the Jews cool, if you can keep them quiet, keep them out of my hair, you get to do what you want to do. That's where their legal authority came from. They refused to submit to God's authority as being superior to all authority. I'll tell you what they were worried about was that Jesus was coming with a bigger kingdom on earth. There was a bigger country. There was a more powerful military. That's what they were asking. Like, are our good times about to be done with? Is there another army coming bigger than Rome? They refused to submit to the reality that there was the ultimate authority, the ultimate kingdom. So where does Jesus' authority come from? Well, that's simple. It comes from God. Matthew 28, 18 tells us, And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. All authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. And we know this is the beginning of the Great Commission. And Jesus does what with that authority? He transfers it to you and to me. This is an equipping moment. What you're watching in real time between these elites and Jesus, this is what happens when people focus on the worldly things. When they start looking at man, when they start looking at celebrities, when they start looking for other people to receive favor. But that's not kingdom authority. That is temporary, natural favor. And it's corruptible, and it's corrupted, and it's temporary. And you see, I will tell you, I think a lot of times in our life, we get to where the getting's good. I'll give you, I'll tell you. I want to get it right. Holy Spirit. I had worldly favor as a chief of police. I had an entire city that catered to me. I had hundreds of people under my authority who did anything I asked them to do. Anything I asked them to do. And I enjoyed that favor. And I thought I was living in faith. I was a believer, but I was operating under the authority of man. Now, I never confused the two. So when the Lord said, leave, I left. I woke up that morning, I told my wife, I'm out. She knew I was moving by the Holy Spirit. I did not confuse earthly authority with kingdom authority. I could have argued, I could have debated with God for four more years to get a full pension, but that wasn't what God asked me to do. He asked me to quit. I gave two week notice, but I'm saying, do not mistake worldly favor with kingdom authority. Okay? This is what these elites have done. What I would encourage you is from Colossians set your mind on things above, not on the things of this earth. A lot of times we get wrapped up in church. The lights are too low. The music's too loud. They didn't mention this. They didn't say that. I will encourage you. And I will tell you, when we're in this house, we're going to focus on the things above. In our daily lives, it is easy. It is a demonic trap to to look at social media, to look at what's going on, to look at the the last press release. Keep your eyes on things above. So Mark 11, 29. But Jesus answered and said to them, I also will ask you one question, then answer me. And I will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John, was it from heaven or was it from men? Answer me. He's just asking these guys a simple question. There's no trick to this. Who sent John the Baptist? Who sent John, God or man? Was John a solo rogue actor with a million followers on social media? Or did God send John to go out and preach the the gospel of repentance? Simple question. These are the greatest minds. These are the greatest minds on earth. And he asked them a simple question. With that simple question, Jesus placed them between a rock and a hard place. He gave them a checkmate, a mic drop. You see the beauty and truth? There's no trickery needed. There's no malicious intent required. It's just plain and simple. Hey, y'all, was John the Baptist from God or from man? So this is the rock and the hard place they were put in between. Option one, if they say John was a man, which meant... Then he was a false prophet. And they knew 
Well, the people recognized him as a legitimate prophet of God, and then the people were going to revolt against him. So do they tell him the truth and lose their credibility? This is the second option. Do they, do they say that John was a man sent from God? Well, if they say that, then the answer, then the next thing is, well, why didn't you believe him? Why didn't you believe him? So now they had a, they had a catch-22. Do they tell the truth and lose their credibility and their control over the people? Or do they lie to hold on to this shaky grip of power? What I want to do is, this is the dilemma that these Jewish elites are facing. I'm going to jump out of Matt Mark, and I'm going to jump to Luke 20. It says, uh, Luke 25, 7. Now, these are the elites. And they reasoned amongst themselves, saying, If we say from heaven, he will say, Why didn't you not believe him? But if we say from men, listen to this, all the people will stone us. These are, the, these are the controllers of this population. Do we tell the truth? You know, if we do, all the people will stone us. For they are persuaded that John was a prophet. So they answered. Like, I love this. These are the greatest minds on the earth at the time. We don't know. Like, that's the best you got? We don't know. I mean, like, say, look. And when they look, run away. But that's the best you got to offer? We don't know. You see, that is what living a life outside of God's righteousness brings. Why are you doing that? Well, I don't know. I don't know. Why are you lying to so-and-so? I don't know. Why are you watching porn? I don't know. Why are you back doing the things you're not so? I don't know. You don't know because you were refusing to fall into compliance and honor the will of God. I want to tell you when it says they reasoned in the Greek, it means to consider, to deliberate, to put their heads together. They were concocting a story. Anytime you operate outside of God's will and you think you're winning in life, I will tell you that it will all crumble in the face of God's truth. There are real world consequences to face. When you and your padnas have got to put your heads together and you've got to concoct a story to contrast the truth of the gospel message, you are operating outside the will of God. This is where repentance is so important. This is where confession is so important. God wants a relationship with these Jewish elites. He just wants them to come into righteous understanding. So in Luke 26, it says, all the people will stone us. I want to be clear. The Greek word, it means to kill by stoning. They're not giving the insults. They're not blocking them on social media. It means to kill, to kill by stoning. This is the dilemma that these old boys have put themselves into, okay? I want to say or ask, how many times do we find ourselves in that same situation? How many times do we find ourselves trying to concoct a story? Man, I hadn't seen you in church in about a month. Well, you know... You know how it is. Okay. And I'm talking the necessity to gather with the saints, not to check off a box as attendance. You know? Hey, hadn't seen you this in a while. Well, you know, I got a little offended at the church. And okay, okay. I just want to challenge you. If you find yourself having to concoct a story to contrast the truth, to get out of the conviction and the correction of the Lord... Stop. Repent. Confess. God loves you. You see, these old boys were trying to get out of a stoning because they were outside the will of God. I will tell you that God will not stone you to death because he sent the rock to save you. Do not fear the rock that was sent to save you. But you've got to repent. You've got to confess. So it says the religious leaders, I say, so it says, I wrote it, so it says. So I wrote, the religious leaders knew what you and I know about Jesus' authority, uh, John's authority to baptize. John 1, 6, 8 says, and there was a man sent from who? God. These 
Pharisees, these religious elites knew this. Why? Because they were right there. They were right there. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. Boom! They could have answered Jesus' question. This man came for a witness, as a, for a witness to bear witness to the light, that all through him might believe. He was not the light, but was sent to bear the light. John never made any misassociation that he was anything more than what God had called him to be. You see, these religious leaders had painted themselves into a corner because they tried to concoct a story. They love traditions of man. They love the law more than they love the Lord. And they found themselves painted into a corner. And I know we've all found ourselves in that same corner. And all the Lord asks us to do is to repent, to confess, and return to the Father. Return to the Father. When I think about the, the, the true authority that these religious elites would have had, had they repented and confessed and come to God the Father, had they been indwelled with the Holy Spirit and the exousia, the legal authority, with their knowledge of the Torah, can you imagine the knowledge of the Torah and the power of the Holy Spirit, the exousia moving in them? Can you imagine how powerful they would have been for the kingdom? But instead, they, they had to hide. They had to hide because they painted themselves in a corner. I want to tell you that Satan is the father of lies. And Ellie, if Ellie's here, she wants to come up. Satan is the father of lies. He is not the grantor of authority. I want to share that if you feel helpless, that if you feel powerful, uh, powerless, at times, even if you feel defenseless, and you get to the point where you just say, what's the use? But what can I do? I will tell you, I was ministering with a brother this week, and those were his words. What's the use? Man, I tell you, it broke my heart. And this is a, this is a faithful saint. What's the use? I will tell you, renew your mind. Stop your stinking thinking from the lies of the devil, that you have no power, that you have no authority, that you have no purpose that you have no identity. Stop the stinking thinking from the devil and renew your mind with the word of the Lord. I will tell you that Satan fears the one. He fears that that one day when you realize how much authority you have in Jesus' name. He trembles at the name of Jesus. And he trembles when you invoke your authority by the blood of the Lamb. I encourage you to exercise the exousia, ex, the, the legal power, the legal authority that God gives you. You have so much power, so much legal authority through the Holy Spirit. Let it be manifested in the Kratos demonstration by laying on of hands, by praying for people, by interceding, by lifting up. I've shared before, it's like you're walking around in poverty. I can't afford this. I can't afford that. And God has given you a credit card with an endless balance. But you don't swipe it. You don't use it. You just stick it in the bottom of your shoe. And at your last day, you see the balance and you realize what you missed out on. You subjected your life to a life of poverty and lack and want and need and despair. You put yourself under a dark cloud when God has given you the authority to trample serpents, to declare His goodness, to demonstrate the Kratos power of the Holy Spirit. Do not be afraid to exercise and move in the power of of the Holy Spirit. God has legally commissioned you with kingdom authority. I ask you, will you walk in that authority? Will you walk in that authority? So if we can stand and I will pray out this, this body, I thank you, Lord, for this message. I thank you for, for a body of believers who receive the word of judgment, who are not fearful at the reality that we all will stand 
before the Lord in judgment. I pray that this is a that this is a motivation for the body to go beyond edifying the saints. We are in Ephesians 4, 11, 12 church. We do believe in the fivefold gifts of ministry. They are meant to edify the body. But I pray that we take the extra step to begin to reach out to those who do not know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. I want to offer right now in Jesus' name that if there's anyone here that has not received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, that you make that decision today. I offer that you come up and meet with one of our elders or meet with one of our elders when we dismiss this service. But I am saying, I am telling you, I'm encouraging you that today is the day to make that decision. Today is the day for you saints to begin sharing the gospel message to those people who do not believe the word. Today is the day for you to begin planting seeds, begin planting the seeds of the gospel message. It doesn't mean you've got to preach a 30, 45, 50, 50 minute sermon, it means you've got to be willing to share the gospel. Right. You've got to be willing to share the gospel. And I've told you, if you only know one line of scripture, share that line of scripture. Because it's the word of the Lord that transforms people. It is the word of the Lord that brings lives into righteousness con- uh, and correction and conviction. Share that word. Share that word. Share that word. So Lord Father, I thank you. I praise you. I praise you for the movement of the Holy Spirit today. I thank you. We started off like a a sweet whisper turned into a a raging fire of of Kratos' power in the Holy Spirit. I thank you, Father God, for the exousia, for the legal authority for all of us to operate in the word of the Lord. I thank you that none of us are out here trying to do it on our own, trying to figure stuff out that our mind doesn't have the capacity to understand the deep wisdom, the deep mystery, the deep secrets of God. Thank you that because of the Kratos power through the Holy Spirit that we can understand these powers. And I pray, I encourage this body to begin making impact upon the dark and lost world. Lord, we thank you. We praise you. We honor you. Mm, We love you in Jesus' name. Amen, Father God. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.